you, sir. <laughs> Thank you to the organizers for arranging this opportunity. Uh, we were originally planning to give a joint paper by Katja, but then it was divided in two parts. So I will give the basic background, and Katja will then discuss the the substance. Uh, let me see. Okay. So. Uh, we are trying to make a point that the Amur River Basin is a, a linguistic area, um, but uh, it will be seen whether you agree or not. Uh, in uh, The Amur Basin is located in the Far East, and we are not only looking at the Arctic zone, but also in the vertical direction. So, as you may know, the languages uh, in this region uh, may be divided typologically in two big groups. In the north we have the so-called Altaic or Ural-Altaic typology and in the south we have the Sinitic typology and as you know some features which are typical of the Sinitic languages uh, they are monosyllabic roots, uh, tonal differences uh, and uh, no morphology or isolating structure. While the Altaic languages are the opposite, they have a suffix or morphology, they have bi or polysyllabic roots, and uh, no tonal differences. Uh, recently, uh, some people have also started talking about a third typological zone, which is called the North Pacific Rim Zone, which extends then to the American side. Uh, I think these uh, zones are pretty clear and we can see some typological uh, features which unite the languages within these zones, uh, especially within Altaic and Sinitic. And uh, uh, these zones have not always been like that. They have expanded or regressed, uh, receded, uh, and uh, there is also a phenomenon called uh, intrusion or Victor H. Mayer calls it Sprach Amoeba, which means that language can enter an alien environment and then it becomes a typological exception uh, from that region. Uh, and typology can also change, so we can see that the genetic lineages uh, of some languages uh, have changed their typology. And in this region we can speak of Altaization, so some languages have become of the Altaic typology, and uh, some languages have become like Sinitic, uh, like, uh, which we call Sinitization, but there is also something which we can call de-Altaization, where language with an earlier Altaic typology loses it. Uh, so, uh, these are the uh, macroscopic zones, so we have the green area shows the Ural Altaic zone which extends from central Scandinavia to the uh, Japanese islands. And then we have some North Pacific Rim languages here in Northeast Asia. And these are also known as Paleo-Siberian or Paleo-Asiatic, and they have much less in common typologically than the ural Thai languages, which are very similar all along this uh, big belt, which suggests that the Uralotype typology has been expansive, and we know actually it has expanded, the Uralic languages have expanded from east to west, and, and all the Uralic and some Turkic and Tungusic languages have expanded from south to north, so these are due to recent expansions. So, uh, we have other linguistic areas in Eurasia, and it's a matter of definition how how uh, we define them, and some very intense language uh, linguistic areas can also be called Sprachbunds. I haven't read what Light Campbell wrote about this, uh, uh, it was mentioned in the previous talk, but uh, um, um, of course the Sprachbund implies that uh, languages are very intensively in contact and they have joint innovations, and there are there are some larger areas, and within these areas there are often uh, pairs of languages which form real Sprachbunds. So in the Baltic Sprachbund we have several uh, groups of languages, but maybe 
uh, a few Sprachbund is, for instance, between Livonian and Latvian, which are very closely intertwined. In the Volga area, we have uh, uh, Mari and Chuvas, which form a clear Sprachbund because they they share most of their typology, so uh, more uh, phonology, morphophonology, and uh, morphosyntax uh, um, are the same. Although the material base is very different because they be belong to different language families. Uh, uh, last week we were in another conference where this concept of Oksprachbund was introduced. Uh, there is also an upper Yenisei Sprachbund in the Minusins Basin. And one Sprachbund on which I have myself worked is the Ambro Sprachbund in northeastern Tibet. We have uh, four different groups of languages which have really become similar. So, uh, so we can say that they form a true Sprachbund. At a much earlier level we have the Altai Sprachbund which explains the so-called Altai languages which are not really related, but uh, they, they have interacted uh, in a long period of time. And uh, we may speak of the Altai Sprachbund, um, we may also speak of, of a Sprachbund between Korean and Japanese. Uh, and in prehistorical Japan, which is closer to our region, we had the German Sprachbund, where there were several languages, maybe some hundreds of languages in Japan, which all became similar, but only one of them survives. It's the Ainu language. So we are trying to uh, say that the Amur region is also a linguistic area, maybe a Sprachbund, maybe not. Uh, we have three language families here. We have the Tungusic family, we have the Amuric family or Nif language, and then we have uh, the Kurilic or Ainuic language family. Uh, this is the region we are talking about, uh, and uh, it's here marked with yellow. Uh, it's basically the lower Amur Basin, but it also comprises some parts of the Sungari River, which flows into the Amur. So we have uh, in this uh, greater region of Manchuria, we have uh, uh, <coughs> six language families. We have Turkic, Mongolic, Tungusic. Japonic, Koreanic, and Amuric. Uh, um, and uh, each of these is divided into a number of branches, some of which are relatively old, but basically all of these are rather shallow families, so they started their uh, differentiation internally at about the Iron Age level. Some of them are even younger. The Amuric family, which is the <coughs> uh, often called the Nif language, is uh, very shallow. It has two two branches, the Amur Nif and the Sahalin Nif, which is also called Niguin. Uh, so these are two closely related languages, but still at the level where mutual intelligi uh, intelligibility is not always possible. Uh, here we have these languages, uh, language, the basic language families of this region, as they are now or in the recent historical past to uh, Ainu was spoken also on the Kuril Islands and on southern Kamchatka, on Hokkaido and on southern Sahalin. Um, and uh, here is a line which uh, potentially separates the uh, <coughs> in inner Asian area which corresponds to Euro-Altai typology and the marginal North Pacific Rim area, which originally is apparently typologically different. Uh, Ainu is normally considered to be a North Pacific Rim language, and maybe Nip or Giliak also, and possibly also Koreanic. Korean was originally part of this. Uh, what we are trying to say is that uh, language can rather easily change its total typological orientation and get uh, uh, new features. And this is very obvious in, in Japanese, in the case of Japanese. I think Japanese was originally a language of the Sinitic type. It came from the continent to Korea, and then it was Altaicized in Korea. Then in, uh, it entered the Japanese islands, where it got additional features, which we may call 
don't see any features uh, from the German language Sprachbund languages. Uh, so, as always, when we go back in time, we get less languages, uh, so we get the corresponding proper languages. So, in the medieval time level, we have uh, four groups of Tungusic languages. We have the Jutchen, the Nanai, Oroch, and Even or Evenic branch from which the modern Tungusic languages then descend. And we have had also some kind of proto amuric which was the proto form of the of the Nif languages. Um, and um, then we have Ainu, but Ainu was uh, just entering this region from the Japanese islands. I'm also interested in how to try to correlate these languages with uh, what we know from proto-historical and historical documents. So we know that in this region there were several uh, states or political formations and we know their locations and names uh, from historical, Chinese historical sources, but we most often don't know what language was dominant in these entities. Um, but uh, when you look at the modern distribution of languages and the other information, we ultimately can get a rather good idea of what languages were spoken where. So in about uh, mid of or 2000 years ago or a bit even after that, uh, Korea was, uh, the, was divided in three kingdoms and we may quite well argue that these three kingdoms had different languages and probably so that the northern kingdom, Hongkuryo, was dominantly Tungusic speaking. This is the homeland of Tungusic, uh, by the southeastern kingdom, Silla, from where then the political power was uh, expanded to all over Korea, was Korean speaking or Korean speaking. And then we had the homeland, the continental homeland of Jap Japonic in the southwestern part of Korea, um, which used to be the Pekche kingdom. Um, uh, so, in this way, we can also place the homeland of Mongolia somewhere to the west of the Tungusic homeland. Um, and the uh, uh, interesting question is then uh, where these Amuric languages or Nif languages come from. We have uh, several proto historical uh, names. Um, located in eastern Korea and to the north of that region. And each of these is a good candidate for the source of the Amuric language family. We will have another conference on rivers uh, in Helsinki in November where I will talk more about the expansion of these languages along the Amur River Basin. But uh, uh, there are rather good arguments to assume that the Amuric language family homeland uh, was located in the Puyo territory. So Puyo is uh, in the north of this map and it was the, the most ancient uh, political state in Manchuria uh, starting about uh, the last centuries before our era and it disappeared in the middle of the first millennium but uh, it's uh, very likely that languages spread from uh, that state northwards and were gradually pushed by the languages spreading from the south, that is from the Koguro state, and that was uh, a Tungusic speaking area. So the languages spread along the Amur in succession. And this model explains many things, among other things, the similarity of Korean and Japanese, which are really a Sprachbok language, a pair. Although today they are spoken quite separately, and in several centuries in the past they have not been in much contact. Um, uh, but they were once coexistent on the Korean peninsula, which explains that they became structurally so similar. Um, there are also many other things which uh, this uh, uh, model expands, but we may now look at the taxonomy of Tungusic. So Tungusic is, uh, as a family, is uh, 
may be divided in two groups, northern and southern. From the northern group we get Ebenik, which is the most expansive group, and the Orochik or Orocho Udege branch, which is now located to the east of the Amur, but must have been somehow uh, connected with Ebenik because they share a number of primary innovations. And then we have this southern group, which is mainly composed of Manchu, or the ancestor of Manchu, Georgia, but also of the Nanai group of languages, which has spread along the Amur and reached ultimately also Sahalin in the form of the Orok or Wilta language. Uh, so here we see the expansion of uh, Tungusic, which also led to the divergence of the language family. Uh, it spread from northern Korea to central Manchuria, where it replaced the Amuric languages, which had already started moving northwards. And then there was a secondary homeland on the middle Amur in the Zeya Basin, from where we uh, can get all the Ebenic languages, like Ebenki, Eben, Vidal, Solon, some of which are spoken south of this line in, in Manchuria, others are spoken, and most of them are spoken in uh, Siberia, all over Siberia, so it has been the most expensive uh, language uh, in recent history in Siberia. And uh, this Amuric language family, represented by Niv and Nivgan, is interesting. Uh, it shares uh, some cultural vocabulary with Tungusi, especially with Manchu, but uh, and it used to be assumed that these uh, elements are all of Manchu origin, Manchu language in, in Niv, but there is actually no evidence of this. They can also be Niv learners in, in Manchu uh, from the time when uh, the Amruic languages were spoken in this uh, Puyo state, which was the first um, political state in Manchuria, so it was uh, an important uh, uh, factor in Manchuria. Um, and also this uh, even modern Nib language is interesting in that it has uh, uh, its own vocabulary for, for some important cultural concepts like metal terms. The metal term for iron is different from what we have in Tungusic or Mongolic or Chinese. Uh, uh, this suggests that they had uh, access to technology at the time of the proto language. Some of these words are shared with Manchu, but as I said, uh, they could as well be borrowings from Amuric to Tungusic as vice versa. And there are some, some words for which we can certainly show that they are loans because they can be morphologically split on the Amuric side, but I don't go into the details here. Um, so languages have moved around the Amur basin from south to north, and certainly this uh, change was triggered by the population growth in the south. Uh, cultural, the cultural edge was always in the south. And uh, this happened mainly not by migrations, but by simply that the local populations always adopted a language coming from the south or a language that had become important in the south. So here is uh, a rather recent picture where you have this Nib and Nibun on uh, Lower Amur and Amur Mouth region and Sahalin. And then you have some Tomusic languages, Negidal and Uts and Nanai in the Amur and Amgun basin. But uh, if we go slightly backwards in time, we can assume that the Negidal, which is spoken in the Amgun Basin, and the Ulcha speakers who are in the Lower Amur Basin were originally Amuric speakers. Uh, uh, and we can see this also from the uh, cultural ties and uh, social ties they have. The Ocha people, for instance, consider that they are actually very close to Niv and the Niv think that Ocha are more or less the same, although they uh, are not speakers of the same language anymore. So it, it's clear that the Ocha and Negidal languages are just uh, forms of Nanai and Ebenki, respectively, which uh, came to, which expanded to uh, populations which were earlier Amuric 
speaking. And if we go further back, um, we have to assume that the Amoric languages um, came from the south and where the Nif and Nifin languages are spoken today, there were other languages of which we don't know uh, anything. They can be found, maybe identified uh, in the local substrate, but they uh, quite possibly were North Pacific Rim regions. There is no uh, North Pacific Rim languages, so there is no region, a reason to assume that they would have been of the Altaic typology. And uh, this uh, geographical uh, movement may explain some of the features that the new uh, language has, and we assume that it has uh, also undergone typological changes of which we will hear in the next uh, talk. Thank you. new terms. Uh, uh, the Aino languages, there are maybe three languages which form a small family, a very shallow family, but from the late medi medieval times they have been separate. Um, so they have been called Ainuic, the Ainuic languages or the Aino languages, but um, the Ainuic, the, the term Ainuic just doesn't sound very good. So I thought that we can replace it with Kurili. Kurili is the old name for Aino, so as you know in Russian they were called Kurili. Uh, and it's, uh, this is from where we get the name of the Kuril Islands. Uh, uh, and Kurili is actually based on the Aino word Kur, Kuru, which means person, man. It was borrowed by the Tungusic speakers and they put the Tungusic uh, plural ending L, so it became Kuril. The Kuril is the name for the Ainu used by the neighboring Tungusic speaking peoples, and it was adopted by Russians, uh, but it's also a word used by the Ainu themselves. Ainu is also used by the Ainu, but um, Ainu people, don't, many of them don't really like this word Ainu uh, for many reasons. One reason is that it uh, sounds a bit like Japanese Inu, which is uh, dog, uh, and Japanese have also noted this similarity. And uh, also, it was not used by all the Ainu. It's the name uh, that has been used by Hokkaido Ainu. While the Sahalin Ainu have a different name, they call themselves Entiu. Um, uh, and we don't know how the Kuril Ainu call themselves. So, so I'm just proposing that we may speak of the Ainu people, Ainu language, uh, but uh, of the Kuril language family. It has not yet been accepted in wide use. But uh, I have seen that the term Amuric has been used by others already, so it's the term for the Nif language family. Uh, Nif is a problematic term because um, it's only the name, in this form it's only the name of the Amur Nif, while the Sahalin Nif call themselves Nivwen, and it's not quite uh, democratic to to uh, force the Sahalin Niv to call themselves Niv because they don't call themselves Niv, but Nivwen. Maybe we could call in some term from Niv and Niv. Yeah, to reconstruct, yeah. Yeah, we could try to reconstruct. Uh, it's not quite easy. Uh, so so I, I propose the term Amuri, especially because uh, it has, this language family has a connection with the Amur River. Any more questions? Can you please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. Yeah, one. Um, uh, I had a question about this last slide. Uh, I was not sure maybe Cassie uh, is going to answer this question. Like what, is, what is the evidence uh, of the existence of this other widespread uh, Northern Pacific Rim uh, language speakers uh, where you showed it? Uh, 
there's not much evidence except that we have to assume that there was some other language which was not Tumutic or Amuric. Why not Amuric? What is the evidence? Ah, yeah, well, of course, we can always speculate that the Amuric language family spread earlier, but uh, I don't think any of these languages occupied a very large area, so they have always occupied one section of the river. And this is true of all parts of the world. So, uh, no proto-language occupied the territory where its descendants are today spoken. So it, the homeland is much smaller, so it can't have extended to this part. But we also have some toponyms in this region which are clearly not uh, Tumuzik and not Amuric, so uh, hydronyms, so, so quite probably. Also, all the languages that are today spoken on Sahalin, there is Nivrin, Ainu, uh, and Orok, and Evenki, they are all uh, recent. So, and we still know that Sahalin was populated since Paleolithic times. So there were people speaking languages, but they are not connected with the languages that spread their historic Thank you once again.